This is the sermon for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. We are reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter, beginning with the 22nd verse. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, before we get into our discussion this morning, I'd like to share a story. It's a rather silly story, actually, perhaps even a bit embarrassing, but I believe everything happens for a purpose, even those things that are silly and embarrassing. I was standing on the dock of the local marina, a place I'm sure I've been a hundred times before, and I was having a discussion with one of the boat owners, and while we were talking, for some reason I decided to take a step back. Perhaps it was to get my eyes out of the bright Florida sun, or, well, in truth, I don't know why I took this step back, but when I did, a number of things immediately ran through my mind. The first was that I was apparently out of dock, as in, I stepped off into thin air. My next thought, immediately following the first, was that this is extremely embarrassing. The third thought had to do with the fact that the water really, really tastes very salty. And that thought came because there really isn't more than a couple of feet from the height of the dock to the surface of the water, so I didn't have very far to fall. Well, amidst all of the other thoughts, like wondering how I was going to get all the silt out of my shoes, and being really grateful that I, first of all, knew how to swim, and also wondering how many people were watching this unintentional comedy, and even being more grateful that I just hit the water and not the side of one of the other boats. Amidst all those thoughts, I will have to confess, I was sort of laughing to myself, thinking, this is probably going to make a great sermon illustration at some point. Well, I'm still looking for the really great application, but I will say that it proves one extremely obvious point that I'm really sure doesn't need proving. I can't walk on water. I can obviously fall into it, and I can fortunately swim in it, and at least on some days I can sail across it. But walking? Well, certainly not yet. And I suspect whether you learned the way I reinforced that knowledge a few days ago, or hopefully just realized it without the saturated street clothes, you can't walk on water either. And maybe that's the first point the authors of Matthew are trying to make with today's text, a theme that seems to thread its way through all the Gospels. Jesus is capable of things that we ourselves cannot imagine doing. He multiplies food in order to feed thousands. He heals the lame and the blind, disarms angry mobs, and raises the dead. Surely these are things that any sincere, caring human being might find 
extremely useful, but yet, most of us at least, can't possibly presume to do these things. But there is another theme that runs alongside the theme of the otherworldly, miraculous nature of Jesus, and we catch just a few glimpses of it today. The implication seems to be that, after all, we actually can, too. I almost don't like to say it because I know it invites scoffing. The words of Jesus recorded in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel are so very clear. Greater things you will do. And countless generations, of course, ask, really? How so? When will this happen? Because I, for one, am still waiting. Perhaps you have wondered as well. But at any rate, there it is. Jesus telling us that we will do greater things. Now, if we look at the details of today's text from Matthew's Gospel, we will see that, in fact, for a moment at least, it seems that Peter is able to, if not do a greater thing, then at least manage an equivalent thing. Peter says to Jesus, who is somehow walking towards them through the storm, Lord, tell me to come out there on the water and meet you, and I will. So Jesus says, Peter, come on out and meet me. For me, the most extraordinary thing about this story is that, in fact, Peter does, at least for about a minute. The fact that Jesus is walking on the water through the storm is, in one sense, pretty easy for me to accept. Once I've accepted that he is the Son of God, the fact that he can walk on the water, well, what else might one expect? But for Peter to do this, really just an ordinary, sometimes bumbling human being, the kind of guy I can imagine being so intense on a conversation that he doesn't realize he's just stepped out into thin air. The fact that Peter, a, a man, kind of like me, can do this, if for only a moment or two, now that's something truly extraordinary. But he can't do it for long. The text goes on to say in verse 30 that Peter looked around, he saw the wind, and he began to sink. Now, if you are a church person, that is to say, someone whose Christian walk is such that you've spent time, perhaps many years in church, then you've almost surely heard this part of the story explained like this. As long as Peter focused on Jesus, he could walk on the water. That is to say, as long as his faith was fixed on his Savior, he was able to do just about anything. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus, in this case, concentrating on the waves and the wind, he began to sink. And for a change, I'm not going to take any real umbrage with the traditional interpretation. Actually, I think that understanding makes a good deal of sense, especially since Jesus, presumably in a gentle fashion, even as he is saving Peter's life, chides him for his lack of faith. But that does beg the question, doesn't it? It's the question I tend to throw out there week after week. What about us? We have faith, don't we? Why can't we walk on the water? Or perhaps more importantly, why can't we make food for the hungry, or heal those who are suffering, or cast out this world's demons of hatred and violence, which seem to exist in ever more frightening abundance? The answer, I suspect, comes from the same place as Peter's partially successful attempt to do what Jesus was doing. Peter saw Jesus doing something wonderful, and Peter wanted to do it as well. Can I do that? he asked. 
And Jesus said, of course you can. Or maybe my junior high school English teacher will be reminding me right now that Jesus more likely said, of course you may, because it remained to be seen, in fact, whether or not Peter actually could. Appropriately named, Peter, the rock, sank like a stone. He wasn't there yet. At least his faith wasn't there yet. Now, he clearly had some, along with a burning desire to be like Jesus, while his companions were presumably doing appropriate boatsman things, like bailing out the boat so it wouldn't sink. Peter, at least temporarily, forgot the immediate peril and wanted, very much like a child, wants to be like its father or mother. And moreover, to be in the near presence of father and mother, Peter wanted to do what Jesus was doing and be exactly where Jesus was. So if Peter's faith, it turns out, was underdeveloped, mine then is most likely practically prenatal. Compared even to sometimes bumbling Peter, who made a great deal of blunders. Well, if Peter was a child of the faith, then I am a newborn infant, and it's possible you may be as well. But then that's all right. You see, Jesus didn't castigate Peter for not being able to pirouette on the waves, nor did he act particularly disappointed in the other disciples for wanting to remain in the relative safety of the boat. Instead, he holds his hand out to Peter, we are told immediately, lifting him back to the place where he may rest and regain strength and perhaps learn to increase his faith. No one, at least no one of right mind, really blames an infant for not being able to do more than what is expected of an infant. No one gets angry at a one-year-old child because he or she cannot ride a bicycle or work mathematical equations or discourse on European literature. But then we also know, or at least hope, that baby will someday be able to do those things and more. Yes, I would say that most of us are spiritual infants, at least so far as our faith is concerned. But then, that's not really a bad thing. For anyone who has been around very young children knows that they are growing and learning and changing every day. And what's more, the nature of infancy is that the child has yet the entire world before it. What that child will be, whom that child will become, all of that remains to be seen. But we do have certain knowledge that the child will become something and someone. As I uh, figuratively and sometimes literally sop out the salt water drenched clothes of my still incomplete attempts to be like Jesus, I'm okay with being an infant in the faith just so long as I know I am still growing and learning and living in the hope that someday, someday, Jesus, I will meet you out there where you are. So what about now? When most of us, we assume, cannot walk on water or miraculously raise the dead or calm storms simply with words or our presence, Another skill, by the way, which I've discovered would be highly useful. What about right now? Just a few principles I think we can take from the text. By the way, this is not the only way to look at this. There's probably never an only way. But maybe this is a good way. Jesus is the first one in the water. And that, to me, sounds almost like a children's game. Lost one in the water is a rotten egg. 
And Jesus is definitely not going to be the rotten egg because he is the first one in the water, or in this case, the first one on the water. We'd never get the idea to walk on water at all if we hadn't seen Jesus do it first. So Jesus is the first one to walk over the waters of violence and vengeance. Jesus is the first one to transcend the storms of hatred and oppression. The first one to calmly walk over and above the storms of death. And he bids us do the same. We see what he is and recognize that this is the way to live. This is the abundant life. And we ask, Jesus, can I do that too? Jesus is more than happy to give us permission to walk on the water, to meet him out there over the storms. So too, when we look to Jesus with yearning to be like him, to live the life he lives, he bids us come. Yes, come on out here. You can do it. You can do what I am doing. In fact, it's what I want you to do. It's why I came to you in the first place. In order to do what Jesus is doing, in fact, I believe even to just make the attempt, we're going to need to get out of the boat. Now, the boat may be rocking and water may be splashing over the edge, but it's probably still safer than out there unprotected. In order to do what Jesus is doing, we will have to get out of the boat. We'll have to take a risk. We're going to have to test our own faith. It's not so easy to leave our comfort zone and walk through the storms the world sets in motion before us. All around us, the world of violence and hatred is telling us, you best just stay in your boat and maybe you'll be okay. Don't come out here where I'm wreaking my vengeance, where I'm blowing about with the winds of hatred. And Jesus tells us, we can overcome those storms of anger. We really can overcome the buffeting waves of prejudice, greed, and envy. But we will have to get out of the boat, out of the safety zone, and move to where Jesus is. Now, chances are we will make a few steps forward. Peter, after all, wasn't a total failure in his attempt. Verse 29 says that Peter indeed walked toward Jesus. And so can we, in our lives, right now. If we have that burning desire to be like him and do as he does, we will be able to move towards him in kindness and compassion, in self-service and nonviolence, in love and in forgiveness. Chances are, at some point, we'll also get scared and start sinking. Please remember, in our text, Peter started off great, but then he got scared. Of course, who could really blame him? Walking on water was something he had absolutely no experience with. And as a fisherman, a man who dealt with water all the time, all of his experience and wisdom told him that what he was doing was not only foolish and dangerous, but impossible. And so, too, our experience in life may tell us when we attempt to get out of our comfort zone, whatever that may be, when we attempt to walk towards Jesus, it is likely that we will be told, mostly by ourselves, this is frightening. This is dangerous, this is foolish, and it is impossible. Which brings us to the final principle. Jesus will not let us drown. When we have reached the end of what our faith allows, Jesus will immediately reach out and pull us back up, returning us to the place of safety and rest. 
Jesus, with his very presence, will calm the storms that assail us and smooth out the waves that buffet us. But please, make no mistake about it. That place of rest where we can, like the disciples, marvel and worship and say, truly you are the Son of God, this is not by any means the end of the journey. This is not the final goal. For we would not have to read very far past this morning's text to see that for Peter and all the disciples, children in the faith that they were, there was so much more in store. There were, of course, more storms, and there were more opportunities to be and do as Jesus was and did. There were more opportunities to walk towards him and be where he is. So too for us. While most of us may be children, even as I consider myself in a way infants in our faith journey, there is so very much more in store for us. Whether in human years we are young or old, whether we have called ourselves Christians for decades or are still on the fence about the whole God and Jesus thing, we have boundless life ahead of us. Yes, storms to overcome and waves to calm. May each of us, in due time, take the first step, or perhaps the next step, out of our comfort zones to be where he is and learn to do what he has done. <laughs>